give a warm welcome to Benjamin Anthony. Good morning, everybody here. It's a tremendous, tremendous privilege for me to be here at the Ray Kushner Yeshiva High School to speak to you about a subject that should be troubling to every one of you. And I'm speaking on the subject of the dangerous rise of Jew hatred and anti-Semitism in the United States of America. I've spoken at every Ivy League university in the United States of America. I have briefed members of the House of Representatives in the United States Congress, Democrats and Republicans alike. I have briefed members of the United States Senate and I have briefed presidential administrations. But my greatest honor is when I'm given the opportunity to speak to individuals of your age. And the reason for that is because you are the future. You are the future leaders of American Jewry. Now there are many people who will refer to you variously as boys and as girls, as kids. But I don't believe that any of those titles describes you accurately. The reality of the matter is that I'm alive today, friends, and I have a country to call home today, Israel, as a direct consequence of the courage and focus and bravery of people far closer to your age than to the age of your parents or your grandparents. And I'm referring to 18-year-old soldiers of the Israel Defense Forces who stand on the borders over there in the Jewish homeland and defend that country, Israel, on behalf of all of us who hold it dear to our hearts. And as a result of that experience, I know what you're capable of when you're focused and when you're motivated. And I will therefore be speaking to you not as kids, not as boys, not as girls, but I will be speaking to you on eye level, as my equal, including if I have to mention or speak about matters that may be somewhat troubling or disturbing to you. I also want to ask that the sign-up sheets here be circulated during the course of this talk so that I can remain in contact with you. And I've also handed out a business card to each and every one of you so that you can be in contact with me after this talk. I want the conclusion of my words to you today to be the commencement of an ongoing working collaboration between us. The rise of Jew hatred in the United States of America is something that does not surprise me because I'm able to trace the patterns of that back to my childhood and throughout my adulthood. The rise of Jew hatred in the United States of America is something that I can trace from my childhood in the UK. Let me explain why. As you know already, my name is Benjamin. I was born and raised in the United Kingdom. I'm one of seven children with six sons, one daughter. Like you, I was raised in a very, very orthodox tradition. But unlike you, I was not able to show my Judaism beyond the four walls of our family home. What that meant, my friends, was that within the four walls of my family home, I would wear a kippah from the age of three, all day, every day. Beyond the four walls of my family home, the chief rabbinate of the United Kingdom instructed the Jewish members of the community there that they were to wear not kippot in the streets, but baseball caps. This photograph is of me and my siblings. I'm the second one on the right. And if I was to show you photographs taken from my childhood, you would see there that every single one of the seven males in my home, my father and his six sons, were walking around not in kippot, but in baseball caps that were shipped to us by our cousins who lived in California, hence the word California on the front of my brother Raphael's baseball cap in this picture. So my life was a series of contradictions. I had to at once be proud inwardly of my Judaism while hiding it outwardly. I did not have 
what you are fortunate to have here in America. The idea that anti-Semitism and Jew hatred existed in the UK was turned into a terrible, terrible reality for me when at the age of 14 I began to be bussed every day for two and a half hours to the, to the closest Jewish high school to the town in which I grew up. I grew up in the city of Leeds. The closest high school was in Manchester. And every day I would make that commute for five hours just so I could be around other Jewish children my own age. In 1994, when I was 14 years of age, myself and three of my siblings, my older brother Jonathan and my two younger brothers, Michael and Rafi, we were walking from the train station that was two minutes walk away from the school gates and we were set upon and attacked by seven men. These were men who were flicking rocks towards us and taunting us for being Jewish. These men had left their homes that day and had arranged to meet us at 8.30 in the morning so that they could murder a Jew simply because he was a Jew. And the Jew that they chose to target was my brother Jonathan. These men attacked him with such viciousness that they nearly achieved their goal. They headbutted my brother, breaking his nose upon contact, knocking him immediately unconscious. I know because I could see his eyes roll back in his skull, denoting the fact that he'd lost control of his faculties. When Jonathan arrived on the ground and lay there completely limp and motionless, these men, they raised up bricks and stones and rocks and bottles and they threw them down upon Jonathan's head and upon Jonathan's abdomen. They stomped upon Jonathan. They got down on their knees so that they could repeatedly pound Jonathan's head into the sidewalk. They jostled and pushed one another for position so that they could get close enough to my brother to do as the ringleader of that gang commanded them to do, which was not to stop until Jonathan was dead. And it was only when I heard the ringleader of that gang give that command that I finally threw myself over Jonathan. I was beaten very, very badly in very similar fashion, but I didn't lose consciousness. And at the end of that attack, I looked over at my brother, who was a bleeding and purpled mess on the floor. He was bruised so badly that when my mother saw him later that day, she did not immediately recognize him. And at the end of that attack, I had to lift Jonathan up in my arms, literally, carry him to the school gates, literally, and watch as an ambulance whisked him away to the nearest hospital. As a result of that attack, my friends, Jonathan had to undergo three liver transplants in one week. That's my older brother, Jonathan. That photograph is taken in 2020. from his hospital bed. Between 1994 and 2020, Jonathan married and he has a young daughter named Maya. And in September 2020, I was told that his third liver transplant was failing and that he urgently needed another organ. So from September 2020 until December 2020, my entire life, was focused on saving the life of a brother who was beaten simply because he is a Jew. And with God's help, we found him an organ. And with God's help, he was successfully transplanted. And he's now alive today and returning to normality. But good health, he will never know. That's what Jew hatred looks like. 
That's what Jew haters do to Jews. And I don't want what befell my family to befall you here in America. When you live a life of fear, of hiding who you are in a given country, for me as a British Jew, the only response was to leave that country. And so when I graduated from university, I moved to the state of Israel. And I joined the Israel Defense Forces. I fought in the Israel Defense Forces. The first war in which I took part was the Second Lebanon War of 2006, a very brutal war. But as I know now, as a veteran of 2006 Lebanon, 2012 Pillar of Defense, 2012 Protective Edge, all wars are very, very brutal. But all wars for Israel are worth fighting for. And yes, they are worth dying for. Though, of course, I hope to live long and peacefully in the service of Israel. I was always ready to lay down my life in the defense of Israel the country and Israel the people, and that includes you people right here in New Jersey to whom I speak today. Before I went into that war in Lebanon, on the base I saw the headlines coming from the Israeli media about the fact that Hezbollah, the terrorists we fought in southern Lebanon, were defeating the members of the IDF. And so I made it my own business to practice everything that I'd learned in basic training in order to return home safely from that war. That meant checking my ammunition levels, ensuring I had sufficient water, making sure that my gun was correctly aimed so that I would hit true and hit accurately, if required, in the defense of Israel. As just one simple soldier among many, many soldiers, far braver than myself. But I also made sure that before I went into war, after I checked my ammunition levels and my water level and my gun's accuracy, as I just said, that I put on tefillin, that I prayed for God's help so that I could return home safely. I can tell you, if you are individuals who wish to fight for the future of Israel, you will never ever win that fight unless you inject into that fight the Jewish aspect of Zionism and your place as Jews in the future of the one and only Jewish state. There will be people who tell you to check your Judaism at the door when it comes to defending Israel because people will not accept a religious narrative about Israel. They're wrong. And I challenge any of you to bring me the narrative by way of which the Jewish people's presence in Israel is accepted. So let's try and be a little bit proud and a little bit unafraid when it comes to presenting just who we are as a people. I continued my service until I was 39 years of age. That's me just before being drafted in 2014 into Operation Protective Edge. And that's me standing guard on the northern border of Israel in front of what remains there of an Israeli flag. I show you these photographs not to present myself as a hero because as I mentioned earlier, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of other soldiers who do a great deal more than anything I will ever do in uniform. I show you these photographs to show you that it was only when I wore the uniform of the Israel Defense Forces that I was able to reconcile finally my inner beliefs as a proud Jew and my outer appearance as a defender of Israel. When my brother Jonathan finally recovered from his surgery after that attack in 1994, he had a dream. 
And his dream was to come to the United States of America and he needed a chaperone and so he brought me with him. And he and I arrived here to Manhattan during Hanukkah. And we walked the streets of Times Square and we stared at the skyscrapers. And we were amazed, but not by the skyscrapers, nor by the lights on those famous billboards. We were amazed by something else. We were amazed by the fact that Jewish business owners put a Hanukkah, a menorah, in their shop window without fear. We couldn't get over that. When I was growing up, we used to put the menorah, the Hanukkah, at the back of the house so that no one would see that this was a Jewish home. We didn't have in England what you have had here in America. And in case you think that what I'm describing to you belongs to the years of my childhood, you should know that what I'm describing is the reality of thousands upon thousands of your Jewish brethren right across the continent of Europe right now, today in Britain, in France, in Germany, in Belgium, and elsewhere. They do not have what you have had. We then flew from New York all the way over to California, and we went to the synagogue of Sinai Temple over in Beverly Hills, which is one of the most prestigious synagogues in the United States of America. And we sat there looking at the Holy Ark at the front, the Aaron Kodesh, and we saw a flag of America on one side, a flag of Israel on the other side, and we could not believe that these two symbols were so reconcilable for American Jews, British Jews, don't have any such sensation. Because they don't have what you have in America. My friends, all of those memories belong to the past. In the present, I am seeing a direct overlay between the experiences of my childhood and my youth and the experiences of modern day American Jewry. Today it's no longer the youth of British Jewry who are being beaten in the streets. Today American Jews are being beaten in the streets simply because they're Jewish. And they're not being beaten in the middle of middle America, they're being beaten and attacked and assailed and assaulted in the strongest pole of diaspora Jewry anywhere in the world, New York, in Brooklyn, and elsewhere. Today, Jewish students are being terrorized on university campuses in a way that British students have been for decades, but with far greater danger because the students of today will be the leaders of tomorrow and they are being educated in environments on campuses that are hostile towards Israel and hostile towards Jews. And the greatest danger on your campuses is that some of the most outspoken critics of Israel are Jewish students. Now, if England turns its face against Israel, not too much will happen, but if America does, that will fundamentally change your experience here as American Jews. Our forebears knew what it was to have a Jewish existence absent, absent a Jewish state. We don't want that. We tried that. We experienced that and it did not work out well for us. And most worryingly, here in the United States of America, you have individuals who peddle Jew hatred in a way that I never experienced during my upbringing in Britain. This man, Kanye West, and many more like him, 
by way of his words and by way of his slander of the Jewish people is placing each and every one of you in danger. Words have consequences. When that thug screamed the words to murder my brother, his followers almost brought that into reality. When Kanye West says that he's going death con three on Jews, or that he applauds the deeds of Adolf Hitler, someone somewhere will try to bring that into reality. My friends, it's time for American Jewry to see these dangers and to make concrete steps and moves to battle back against them. It is no use to face this Jew hatred and to wonder whatever will you do. By show of hands, how many of you here in this room have heard of Black American History Month in the United States? How many of you? Just raise your hands higher so I can see them. Okay. Let the record reflect that's almost all of you. By show of hands, how many of you here in this room can tell me when American Jewish Heritage Month is? Without yelling by show of hands, how many of you here? I'll come to you if I want to. There's one hand raised so far. I'll come to you in a minute, sir. There is a month designated by the President of the United States of America called American Jewish Heritage Month. Sir, do you know when it is? Perfect. And what's your name? Aaron, the man of peace, says it's in May. Give him a round of applause. Settle down. I don't have long at the podium. Settle down. The reason that almost all of you know when Black American History Month is is because during that month, things happen. Wonderful things that demonstrate the contribution of black America to the tapestry of the United States. And the reason that none of you except Aaron is aware of when Jewish American Heritage Month is, is because during that month, nobody does a damn thing. Nobody responds to this kind of hatred. Nobody promotes their pride in their Judaism. Nobody promotes their pride in Israel and the Jewish future. And that should tell you that if you don't do that, nobody else will. And that should tell you that if you don't celebrate your Jewish heritage, that heritage eventually is likely to disappear. So I extend a, a challenge to all of you before I conclude with one phrase. Our organization, the Miriam Institute, is set to award $5,000 in prize money to the top three individuals who draw together a program to celebrate their Jewish heritage and their attachment to the State of Israel on a project that will go live during American Jewish Heritage Month. $5,000. I want your ideas. I don't want to come here to New Jersey from Israel to tell you what you must do to celebrate your American Jewish heritage. I want you to tell me what you're willing to do and how you will do it and how you will ensure that you are part of the force that battles back against this Jew hatred that is sweeping across America. I'm not asking any of you to go and grab a gun and serve in the Israel Defense Forces, though I know there are alumni of this school who have proudly served, and I applaud them. 
But I'm asking you to assign your brains, your talent, your wits, your guile and your courage. So that others will learn from you just how dear your American Jewish identity is. A final word. People like Kanye West, they are trying to bully you. And people like Kanye West are trying to force you to divide within yourselves your pride as an American with your pride in your Judaism. They are trying to inflict upon you the plague with which I grew up as a British Jew with a division between who I was as a Brit and who I was as a Jew. And you must not allow him to succeed. I know that when Jew hatred comes, it can be difficult to stand fast in the face of it. I know that you know that these Jew haters outnumber you. He has approximately three times the number of Twitter followers as there are Jews throughout the entire globe. They do outnumber you. But Judaism has something to say about that. And I'm going to conclude by quoting it to you today. It's not the first time the Jewish people have been pursued. We were pursued by the Egyptians when we fled from our slavery. But one of the things that I received when I was sworn into the IDF was a machine gun, and the other item was a chumash. And written in that chumash by my secular lieutenant was the following phrase. He said, Ki al oivecha, v'raita sus v'rechev amrav mimcha, lo tira mehem, ki Hashem elokecha imach, what my lieutenant quoted was the phrase that says, when you go out to do battle with your enemies, and the Talmud teaches us, our sages teach us that the enemy can be the enemy within, the enemy of doubt and uncertainty. When you go out to do battle with your enemies and you see their horse and their chariots before you, a people more numerous than you, you will not fear them. Because as I knew that day, the Lord your God is with you. He who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The enemies might be numerous, but with God's help, with your determination, with your engagement, we'll part this wave of Jew hatred that's washing its way towards us. And we together will arrive on the banks and shores of our collective safety, destiny and future. It's an incredible existence, the American Jewish existence. Don't allow my story to become your story. Understand what you're fighting for. Fight for it with pride. And together, we will know the days of Shalom al Israel, of peace over Israel both the country and the people. Stay strong and go from strength to strength. Thank you.